Welcome again. I'm Allison Dahl, co-chair of the National Affairs Series Planning Committee and the Committee on Lectures, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Our guest linguist found himself on an unexpected Hollywood adventure when he was hired to create the language spoken by aliens on the distant moon of Pandora for James Cameron's avatar. The Navi language he created had to include grammar, syntax, and vocabulary. He worked personally with the actors to perfect Navi pronunciation and handled all translations from script to song lyrics to dialogue for the Wii and Xbox video games related to the film. Dr. Fromer has an eclectic background that includes teaching in Malaysia with the Peace Corps, working as a strategic planner and business writer in the corporate world, and more recently as a professor in the University of Southern California's Marshall School of Business, where he, he was director of the Center for Management Communication. Fromer earned a PhD in linguistics from USC with a dissertation on aspects of Persian syntax. He also created the Martian language for the Disney film, John Carter of Mars. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Fromer. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you all for coming on a kind of nippy evening to hear about Navi. I've got to tell you, I've done a number of these talks now, uh, both here in the States and uh, in places like Sweden and Australia, and I've never had an audience like this. <laughs> this is kind of intimidating, but, uh, but thank you all. And uh, it's a great honor and a, and a pleasure to be here. Um, so let me greet you properly in Navi. So what I said was, hello, my friends. I see you all. That's the famous, I see you from Avatar. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening talking about the Navi language. It's a pleasure and from the perspective of just a few years ago, uh, quite a surprise. If you had told me uh, back then that I would be designing a language, an alien language for the most commercially successful film in the history of cinema, I would have asked you what you'd been drinking or perhaps smoking. But uh, sometimes life has, has surprises. Life often has surprises, and sometimes those surprises are good ones. So um, what I thought I'd do is go through um, a few aspects of the language and the development of the language. Um, as you heard from Alison, I, until recently, used to teach in the business school. And I taught uh, mainly a course called Advanced Writing for Business. And one of the things I told my students to do, both in writing and in oral presentation, is to let people know what you're going to say. So this is what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to talk about how it began, the steps involved in building a language, and um, hopefully I'll show you some of the, the nuts and bolts of the language as well, what it was like to work on the set, then we'll have a little self-contained Navi lesson, which will be the audience participation part. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's happened to Navi after the film, which in certain respects is, I think, the most interesting of all. So uh, how does a professor in a business school uh, get to design a language for James Cameron? Well. Uh, You've heard something about, about my background, just to kind of, kind of go over this territory very, very briefly. Um, when I was eight years old, everyone knew what I was going to be, including myself, which was an astronomer. And so that's why I began majoring in astrophysics at the University of Rochester in New York. That lasted about three years. I wound up as a math major, having very little sense of what I would do with my life. 
then I made one of the best decisions I've ever made, which was to go into the United States Peace Corps. So I wound up in Malaysia teaching math and some English as a second language. And I got into the Malay language and realized that I really liked languages. I had some background in languages prior to that. Um, as a Jewish kid growing up in New York, the first thing you do when you're six years old is get sent off to Hebrew school. So I had some experience with Hebrew. I started studying Latin in junior high school. I don't know if they still do that, but we did it back then. I had some French in high school. I had some German in college and, and some more French. I tried to study a little bit Arabic on my own. So I had, the, I had the interest. But when I was in Malaysia, I realized that this was more than just a passing interest. I really had a bit of a passion for language and languages. So when I began my graduate work at USC, it was in linguistics. Uh, I spent a wonderful year in Iran. In fact, uh, we're, where's, where's Barbara? Uh, we discovered driving up here from Des Moines uh, this afternoon something quite extraordinary. I was in Tehran, Iran, for a year, 1975 to 1976, and it turns out so was Barbara. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, who, who knew? So, uh, so we, we, we kind of have that in common. That was a wonderful year. And during that time, I wound up uh, learning a fair amount of Persian so that when I got back to the United States, got back to USC, um, I actually changed my dissertation topic to a topic in Persian grammar and finished that. So at that point, I decided I'm not sure I want an academic career. Long story short, I wound up in a corporation in Los Angeles, was there for 10 years. Then had a chance to come back to the university and discover there was this thing called business communication. So I figured, well, 10 years in business gives me some experience there. Linguistics is communication, put it together. So until May of last year, I was teaching in the Marshall School of Business at USC. Um, became chair of my department in uh, 2005. And then later that summer, came the fateful email. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of how it all got started. It turns out that in the summer of 2005, James Cameron's production company, Lightstorm Entertainment, was looking for a linguist who could design a language for a major science fiction film. At the time, no one ever heard the term Avatar. It was called Project 880. And it had that code name for, for years. So um, they did what was kind of natural. They uh, sent out a letter of inquiry, essentially, an email, to linguistics departments in universities in the area. Uh, USC got the email, but not my department. Remember, I'm in the business school. The linguistics department gets the email. And I have to thank my lucky stars. I have a, a very important person in my life who was in the linguistics department. His name is Ed Finnegan. He was, was my first professor in linguistics, mentor, fabulous teacher, became my co-author and a close personal friend. Anyway, Ed was one of the people who got the email, saw it, and said to himself, this sounds like Paul. So he forwarded me the email, best email I've ever gotten. And I said to myself, yes, I want this. So what I did is I sent um, James Cameron a copy of the book that I had co-authored, it's a linguistics workbook. It's called Looking at Languages. It has data in about 30 different languages. Expressed my interest. And a um, week or two later, I got a message. Um, Why don't you come down to Santa Monica and meet with this guy? <laughs> so uh, that was one of the most amazing 90 minutes of my life uh, in James Cameron's private office with memorabilia of his films surrounding us, and just the two of us. At some point, there was a third, was John Landau, who was a producer of Avatar. We had quite an extraordinary afternoon. Uh, Cameron gave me a sense of his vision for the film, for the language, kind of stuff, things he had in mind. We batted around some ideas. I guess it went well, because at the end, um, he stood up, shook my hand, and said, welcome aboard. So that was, that was the beginning of a total, a total upheaval and a wonderful upheaval in my life, um, being involved in, in, in this project. 
So uh, how does one go about creating a language? Well, in this particular case, I didn't start from absolute zero because James Cameron himself had come up with about 30 some odd words in Navi. Most of them were names of characters, Etukan, for example. But there were some key terms that were his. Uh, the term Navi itself was James Cameron. Uh, the word Irayo, which means thank you, was his. So I had a bit of a sense of the sounds he had in his ear. To me, they sounded a little bit Polynesian. And I think possibly one of the reasons was that he had recently returned from a diving trip in New Zealand. Of course, New Zealand has an indigenous language, is Maori, which is a Polynesian language. I think maybe he had some of that in his ear. So I took a look at that, took a look at those words, and incorporated those sounds and those combinations of sounds into Navi, but then expanded it considerably. So uh, let's kind of go into some of the nitty gritty details of the language. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep it relatively non-technical. There will be a few maybe linguistic things I'll throw in there, but um, I, hope you, I hope you find this interesting. Uh, believe it or not, there are some fairly well-defined steps that one goes along. Before anything else, though, I, I need to mention two important constraints that I had to adhere to in developing the language. Uh, one was a basic assumption, which was that the natives of Pandora have essentially the, the same sort of vocal mechanism, voice production mechanism, that we have. And the reason for that was that this would all be voiced by human actors. Uh, one thing that, that, that Cameron refused to do was alter the, uh, the, the sound stream electronically at all. So what you hear is actually what's coming out of the mouths of the actors. So it had to be something that human beings could pronounce. And then the assumption then was that the Navi have a very similar uh, voice production system. The other constraint was a little bit more subtle. If you know, if, if, if you see the film, by the way, I'm, I'm curious, how many people have actually seen the film? Okay, <laughs> kind of what I expected. Okay. How many times? I, uh, I, I'll, I'll be talking about this towards the end, end of the talk. I had a, um, had a wonderful experience back in October meeting some people from the Navi community. Uh, one young man had flown in from France for, the, for this get together. Uh, and we're talking about how many times people had seen the movie in theaters. And one person said, I've seen it eight times. One person said, I've seen it 12 times. So um, this fellow reaches into his pocket, pulls out a pile of ticket stubs, 33. <laughs> so I mean, that's, 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 that's a dedication. Anyway, since you've seen the movie, you know that <clears throat> human beings, according to the premises of the film, have learned the language. Well, that means that the language, the language is learnable by human beings, which means it probably has a certain structure, which means it probably follows what we are discovering about the universals of grammar, which is to say it can't be so way out in terms of the grammar, in terms of the structure, that no human being could learn it. So that was the second major constraint. Okay. With those things in place, then you can begin developing the various aspects of the language. So the first thing to talk about is phonetics and phonology. This has to do with sounds. What kind of sounds does the language have? Just as importantly, what kind of sounds does the language not have? So um, here, for example, is the consonant system. This is simply a list. Those of you who have taken um, some ele elementary linguistics know exactly why things are listed in this order. But there are some things that you'll notice immediately. Um, first of all, some major sounds are missing. Notice there's no B, D, or G. There's no B, D, G. Okay, linguists call those voiced stops. Not, it doesn't have those. By the way, that's something that's characteristic of Polynesian languages, which is one of the Maori influences. Um, another thing you'll notice is that top line. These are the sounds that have attracted a fair amount of attention. They're real language sounds and real human languages. They're 
called ejectives. And I chose to write them as px, tx, and kx. The x doesn't have a sound of its own. It's just a way of indicating this particular type of sound. They sound like a, u, e. Uh, these sounds are found in, for example, uh, some Native American languages. They're found in certain parts of Africa, in Ethiopia, for example. Uh, the national language of Ethiopia, Amharic, has those adjectives. They're found in Central Asia and so on. So uh, I kind of like the sounds. I thought they'd be fun uh, for the actors to play around with, fun for the audience. They had kind of a little bit of a, of a, of a spice, I think, to the language. So those are the consonants. Uh, now, you don't just talk about consonants. You also talk about what kinds of combinations of consonants. Linguists call these consonant clusters. So here, um, here are some words in Navi. Uh, and you'll notice there are some very interesting, I think, consonant clusters in the beginning. So um, the words are fnga, fakim, skom, steli, tske, tsnaove. And there are, there, are, there are very strict rules as to what sounds can combine in consonant clusters, what sounds can't. What sounds can come at the beginning of a word, what, what sounds can come at the end of a word. But you're still not finished, because then there's a question of how sounds influence each other and how sounds may change into other sounds in given circumstances. Uh, this happens in every single language, certainly happens in English. Uh, Okay, here, here, here are some nouns, okay. Very basic nouns in the language. Uh, nadi is I, kifke is world, pai is water, direa, spirit, elan, heart, and ora, lake. By the way, I, um, I should mention something about this apostrophe there. It actually means something, it's not there for decoration. When I first saw the word Navi, which of course has the apostrophe, I said to myself, that's going to mean something. And what, uh, what I decided it should mean is something that I think was, is very natural uh, to come up with, which is a glottal stop. The glottal stop is this sharp break that you hear. You hear it marginally in English. For example, when we say, uh oh, notice it's not uh oh, it's uh oh, and there's a very sharp break there. Well, that break is a glottal stop. And so the correct pronunciation of NA apostrophe VI is Navi, Navi, with a, a break there. Not Navi, Navi. So this word here is Telan, heart. Now, how do you say in these things? Well, Nari, in the I, mi means in, Minari. Okay, so how do you say in the world? Okay, mihifke, aha. Pai is water, in the water, mafai. Pirea is spirit, in the spirit, anyone want to guess? I'm sorry? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> good one, John. Misirea, okay, etlan uh, becomes Mitelan, the X is gone, the ejective is gone, and ora with the glottal stop becomes meora, and that's gone. So this is part of a process. The process is called lenition. It's found in a lot of languages, but it's one of the things you have to learn and become very accustomed to if you're going to speak Navi. Okay, so that's sounds, phonetics, phonology. By the way, I should mention <clears throat> this is a part of the la of the language that uh, that that James Cameron and I collaborated on to a certain extent. Uh, before I even began coming up with words and translating things, I wanted to make sure that the sound that I would come up with is something that he would like. So what I did is I created these things that I called sound palettes. It was gibberish. It, was, it didn't have any meaning attached to it at all, but it was just words, pseudo words, combined into sentences that might actually give an, an oral impression of how the language would sound. And I played around with different things. I played around with tone. You know, the way Chinese does. Chinese has, Mandarin has four tones. Ma, 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 ma. 
and they all mean four totally different things. Uh, so he didn't like that. I played around with distinctive vowel length, having short vowels, medium vowels, long vowels, which could distinguish words. He didn't like that, but he liked the adjectives. So anyway, uh, this is a sound system that he, he did approve of. After sounds, you move up one level and you talk about morphology. Morphology has to do with the way words are built up from meaningful elements. So what do the nouns in this language look like? What do the verbs look like? Okay, I'll, I'll just give you a few examples. So here, here, here are some verbs. So the root is taron. And here are some forms of the root. And I have to tell you when, when you, when you take a language like Spanish, you learn all these conjugations and, and different forms of different words. So Navi has this too, but in a slightly different way than you might expect. So taron is hunt. Tolaron means hunted. See if you can tell what's going on here. Tayaron means will hunt. Tievaron means maybe about to hunt. Tirmareion means has just been hunting and I feel good about it. <laughs> and so on. Uh, so I'm sure that those of you who've studied foreign languages uh, or have even looked closely at English realize that, that we have these elements that go either usually in the beginning or at at the beginning or at the end of a word. Okay, want, wanted. Okay, so we have prefixes and suffixes. What, what's happening here though? It's not coming at the beginning of the word, it's not coming at the end of the word, it's coming in the middle of the word. So these things are called infixes. Are they, um, are they possible in human language? Yeah, but they're relatively rare. But Navi makes use of these infixes exclusively. So. Um, so here's, um, here's, I think, um, a, good, a good sense of where the root is, which is the red, and where the infixes are. So these are things that are sort of shoved into the middle of the root to give you things like tense, to give you things like aspect, whether something is completed or not completed, and also to indicate how you feel about the subject. Uh, someone in the Navi community uh, played around with how long a word could you come up with shoving as many infixes as you could into the middle of a word. Uh, we kind of had fun with this, so here's a result. <laughs> and what it means is, I'm so jazzed that he may be about to drink himself to death. <laughs> okay, uh, and it really does mean this. So how is that possible? Well, uh, Bo is his, it is he, rather. Nenap means uh, by means of drinking or in a drinking fashion. But all the other stuff is contained in that gigantic verb. And here's the analysis. The root is die, it's terco. Everything else is a series of infixes that's been shoved into the middle of the root. So terco is to die. Then you have something that says to bring about dying, which is to kill. And then you have a causative, and you have a reflexive, and then you have this stuff at the end, which means I feel good about it. So all, all together, I'm so jazzed that he may be about to drink himself to death. Okay. Uh, nouns, what do nouns look like? Well, here are some nouns in Navi. Uh, this is the character Eitukan, his name. And these are the various forms that the name can take, depending upon the position of the word in the sentence. Now, if you've studied languages like Latin or Russian or ancient Greek, many other languages, you're very familiar with this idea. In English, word order is tremendously important, the order in which something comes. So John loves Mary, three elements, right? Okay. I can, I can permute these in various ways. If I scramble them around and I say, Mary loves John, that's English, but it's a different message. It does not mean the same thing. If I come up with loves Mary John, that's not English. Mary John loves is not English. 
So word order is very important. And in particular, word order helps us determine who is doing what to whom. Well, not all languages work like this. Uh, some languages have nouns that essentially hold up little signs that say, I'm the subject, I'm the object. And if that's the case, then you can scramble things up in any number of ways, and it still means the same thing. And so this is what happens in Navigate. It has what linguists call a case system. We have it in English, but only with pronouns. The difference between I, me, my, mine, difference in case. But we don't do it with nouns very much at all. But Navi does it with nouns like crazy. So um, what kind of case system is it? OK, now this is going to get a little technical. And I apologize ahead of time, but it won't last very long. Uh, case marking for subjects and objects. Um, most people know what a subject is. Uh, it's, it's, in most sentences, it's what's kind of doing the verb. So John is sleeping. John is the one who is sleeping. Okay. Mary is eating ice cream. Mary is the one who is eating the ice cream. And ice cream itself is the object, or sometimes called the patient, which is why you see a P, a P there. But what's the difference between John and Mary in these two sentences? Well, Mary is doing something to something else. What's a anyone know the term we use for that? What kind of sentence is it? Yeah, OK. So it, it's transitive. So that's a transitive structure. But John is sleeping is intransitive. John is not sleeping anything. He's just sleeping. OK, so how do languages mark these things? How do they mark S, which is the intransitive subject? A actually stands for agent, which is the transitive subject, and P for patient. Well, uh, if you think about it, those mathematicians here, there are, in fact, five different ways you could do it. You could. Mark them all the same, or just don't mark them at all. That's number one. Okay. Language like that is English, at least for nouns. Okay. You could say, OK, the subject and the agent, intransitive subject, transitive subject, those things will be marked one way, and P will be marked, the object will be marked another way. Uh, are there languages like that all over the place? Latin, Russian, Greek, uh, many others. Okay. Uh, Number three, is that possible with the agent? The transitive one is, is marked one way, and the other two are marked similarly. Yes. Now, that's relatively unfamiliar to many people. But there are lots of human languages that do that. Basque, for example. It's called an ergative absolutive language. Okay. Uh, number four, as far as I know, doesn't exist. Number five is the one where all three agents or all three uh, uh, entities are marked differently. Is your language like that? Yes, it's called Navi. So, so that's the one that I chose for that. Are there Earth languages like that? Yes, but very rare. Uh, I only know of two. One is the American, uh, Native American language Nez Perce, spoken in Idaho, I guess. And the other is an Australian language, Wangumara. So you, 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 you can pr probably see what, 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 I, what I try to do. I try to come up with stuff that exists in human language. It's possible for human language, but relatively rare. So the result of this is that you can take a sentence like, Eitukan sees neitiri. One version of number one is, Eitukan sea neitiri. And you can mix them up in all possible ways. It still means the same thing. That's syntax, how words combine into phrases and sentences. Beyond that, we have the interplay between language and culture, language and physiology, which is a very important aspect. You can't distinguish a language from its culture, from its context, from its environment. Um, how does this enter into Navi? Well, in a number of ways. Uh, one thing I noticed was that the Navi only have four fingers on each hand as opposed to five. By the way, if you look at Avatar really carefully, just about the only difference that I know, the only external difference between the avatars, Jake in avatar form, Grace in avatar form, and 
the real Pandorans is that the avatars have five fingers on each hand because of human DNA, and the natives of Pandora have four. So with four fingers on each hand, it occurred to me um, they probably don't have a decimal counting system. It's probably octal, probably base eight. And so, in fact, um, I mentioned that to Jim Cameron. He said, yeah, absolutely. So the way you count in Na'vi is au, mune, e, sing, mr, puka, kine, vol, that's eight. Nine is eight and one, volao. Ten is eight and two, and so on. Um, okay, what other aspects of, of culture come into play? Every language has its own sayings, its own, its own proverbs. Here's one that I really like, which, uh, which was coined by someone in the Na'vi community. Um, the tail and ears also speak. And if you've seen, if, if you watch the movie carefully, you know that this is really true. That if you look at, at, at the Pandorans, the way their tails move, the way the ears go, can give you a very good sense of what's really going on in their heads. Um, aside from that, there is the whole aspect of honorific language. We all have different ways of speaking at different times for different circumstances. So ceremonies are very important for the Na'vi. Um, you know, we're getting a little reverberation here. Is it, is it because of... Stay further back? Okay, I'll try. This is better, isn't it? Okay. I'll try to stay here. So, um, okay. um, there is an honorific or ceremonial um, level of the language where pronouns are a little bit different, verbs are a little bit different. So the word for I, which is normally oe, in a ceremony becomes ohe. The word for you, which is normally nga, is in a ceremony becomes nge nga, and so on. And finally, um, every language has ways, efficient ways, of expressing concepts that are important to it. So one of the concepts on Pandora that's so important is harmony, living in balance with nature. The word for that is meo auni aea. And uh, I originally came up with this word as an example of vowel clusters of how a word can exist almost entirely of vowels, where the vowels sort of glide from one to each other. I really like the way it sounds, meo auni aea. So that is part of what went into, actually that's, that's a large part of what went into constructing the language. Um, turn this off for a second. Okay, so at that point, I was ready to begin coining words. What was driven, what drove the development of vocabulary, as you might imagine, was the script. Okay. Essentially, I was given dialogue, and a certain character had to say certain things in the language, and I had to translate into the language. And so if um, someone was talking about hunting, then I obviously needed a word for hunt. If someone wasn't talking about sewing, then I didn't need a word for sewing. And so that's kind of how the, language, how the vocabulary developed. And then it was time to work with the actors. And that was absolutely a great, uh, a great part of the fun of the, whole, uh, of, of, of the whole enterprise. So I did several things. Uh, first of all, I gave them the stuff in written form. And I gave it to them in two ways. First, I um, wrote it in real Navi, the, the spelling system I had come up with. I also sort of transcribed it into um, sort of a quasi english -y kind of phonetic thing. So the sound U, for example, which is normally written just with the letter U in Navi, I also wrote it as O-O for the actors, which kind of helped them understand what I meant. Then I created MP3 files, which I sent them by email, which they could download and hopefully put onto their iPods and maybe listen while they were working out or something like that. And then I had a chance to meet with each of them individually, typically a few weeks before they were going to do a certain scene to help them with pronunciation. And if you, if you think about it, they had a really 
tough challenge here. First of all, they had to learn how to say this stuff. And by the way, I, I, I should mention, none of the actors really learned the language in the sense that they knew the grammar and they could develop stuff on their own. That, was, you know, that, 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 that wasn't part of their job description. Okay. What they did have to do was learn to pronounce the stuff that I gave them and make it sound convincing. So it's not just a matter of the words, but it's a matter of putting the words together into a sentence so that it flows and it sounds like it's really your language. And also, knowing where to put emphasis and where not to put emphasis. I recall an incident where I was on the set uh, and I was working with a particular actor and he was really getting into it. And he, was, he had this line to say and he was saying it very, very forcefully. And there's this one Navi word, F-T-E, F -T -E, and he just came up with this F-T-E, and it was really strong. F-T-E means so that. So, you know, I had to say, you know, probably you want to put the emphasis in a different part of the sentence. So th th that, was, that was part of what I had to do. Uh, by the way, they had to memorize all the stuff because there were no cue cards. When you're, you know, when you're writing an ikran, you can't be looking at off, off, off to the side of the cue card. So they had to memorize the stuff, learn how to pronounce it, make it sound convincing, uh, and also act. So th I, I, I really think they all did quite a remarkable job. Uh, so this is what it looked like on the set. Uh, doesn't look much like Pandora, does it? Okay. Uh, this, by the way, uh, was a um, uh, was a banned picture. It was. I mean, the, the security on the set was so tight that there was a guard at the door who would check people for cameras. I mean, they, they, they wanted it, it, it that tight. Obviously, somebody snuck a, 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 a cell phone in and took a picture and put it on the internet. So don't tell Fox that I put this on here. Although, at this point, I think they probably don't care. Uh, I spent as much time as I could on the set when the language was involved. There were days when I was here for 12 or 13 hours. I'm not going to tell you that every minute of the 12 and 13 hours was involved in the language. What I discovered was that there are long, long stretches that have nothing to do with me, uh, where I was just kind of sitting off, maybe you know, trying to develop the language further or, or whatever, or, or taking part in the most, by far the most dangerous thing on a movie set, uh, which is, all of a sudden the name is escaping me, but, but I, although I forget the name, I'll tell you what it is. It's this little room, the, okay, the craft services room. It's a little room where they are constantly bringing in incredible food every two hours. <laughs> and everybody is free to go in there and participate. And it's incredible stuff because they only go to the best. And at, it's literally every few hours new stuff appears. And if you're not careful, you will walk out of there like this. <laughs> So th that, was a, that was a challenge when I was uh, not involved in the language. But then there were moments of panic where people would come up to me quickly and say, oh, Paul, we, 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 we've just changed this, and we need to know how to say this, and how do you say that? Okay. So uh, if I had the word, great. And if I didn't have the word, I would say, give me a few minutes. And I would try to come up with something or come up with a new structure that I didn't have. Uh, th the incident that stands out in my mind more than any other, uh, there was a time when James Cameron and Sam Worthington, who plays Jake, came up to me and said, we've decided that at this point in the film, Jake needs to be telling a story to the warriors. By the way, this didn't make it into the final cut, but at the time, we thought it would. And he's going to tell a story about flying this, this ikran, this, this banshee, around and being attacked by this gigantic predator, which almost bit him on his big blue posterior. So he didn't say posterior. So he said, okay, how do you say big blue ass? So I said, give me five minutes. So I had big and I had blue, but I didn't have the word for ass. So um, I'm sitting next to, okay, CCH Pounder is here and someone else is here. And I begin frantically trying to come up with words. And I tried them out on, on these people and CC just turned up her nose at a lot of the words. But eventually um, we came up with the word, him. 
It's called TXI accent M, which means posterior. And so if, 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 if you're interested and you ever want to use it, the big blue S is Enat Imatsau. So, uh, so a few, a, few, a few shots of the actors of this is obviously um, James Cameron and Sigourney Weaver in a pensive moment. Uh, here's Sam Worthington. And this, by the way, is how we saw the actors. Not blue at all, but wearing what to me looks like um, uh, a diving suit. Right with these sensors and one red glove and one blue glove, you can't see it clearly in this picture, but there are green dots all over Sam's face, and this is all for the technology, and at, and um, the the technology is such that there are like I think 16 cameras digitizing this entire performance that the actor does, and through the magic of the technology, which Jim created, this is transformed into this, and this, and this, and this, and this. Now, I couldn't, I couldn't resist including this picture. Uh, I tell you, I know exactly when this was taken. This was taken December 15th, 2009. Uh, the movie opened on December 18th for the general public in the United States, which is a Friday. The Tuesday of that week, there was a special screening of the movie for cast and crew. It was held at the very famous um, Chinese theater on Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, we all attended. It was an amazing event. The, the, the energy and the atmosphere was something I've never experienced before. Every single seat in that huge theater was occupied by someone who had made some contribution or other to the film. And it was the first time any of us would see the film in its final, in its final version. Uh, Cameron spoke, John Landau spoke, then the film showed in glorious 3D, the whole thing, and at the end, everybody stood up and cheered. It was, it was really very moving. And then there was a cast party uh, afterwards, and that was part of it. Okay, uh, at this point, let me see how we're doing on time. Ooh, okay, oh, I have a speed up yesterday. Um, how are we, um, have I made another 10 minutes or so, would that be okay? Okay, good, okay. Um, now, now we have come to the audience participation part. Uh, this is a little self-contained Navi lesson. Uh, I originally developed it for a TEDx presentation at USC back in April of last year. And uh, I call it, it's a little lighthearted thing, I call it sweet nothings in Navi, or romance in the language of Pandora. So, um, imagine that you've just arrived on Pandora, and you're having a ball bouncing around in your 10-foot-tall blue avatar body. But what if you encounter a local who tickles your fancy? Okay. <laughs> How do you make you move? What do you say? Well. If you're Jake Sully, I forget the code. Is it Shift F5? Control F, thank you. Miles helped me, and I, I have totally blanked on how to do this. Okay. Uh, okay, so if you're Jake Sully, you're lucky enough to have a native who can help you learn the language. The language is a pain, but, you know, I figure it's like field stripping a weapon. Just repetition, repetition. Navi. 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 Okay. By the way, I know there are a lot of people here who are interested in, in ESL and TESL. This is probably not a recommended pedagogical technique for, for teaching a language. Okay. Uh, However, okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. But 
even if you don't have a Nate to help you along, you can still learn a few basic phrases which will get you pretty far. So the first word that we're gonna learn is hello, which is kal it, kal it, try it, kal it. The, the TX is that ejective thing we talked about. Um, the way, the way I, uh, I help the actors do it, um, and this is not my own, this comes from the University of Michigan Linguistics website. Uh, try to make a T as loudly as you can without breathing. Hold it. Okay, and then, and then add a vowel. The vowel is I, as in big or sig. So, I, I. Okay, and then narrow the gap between the consonant and the vowel. I, I, I. And eventually you get I. Yeah, okay, so it's called I. Um, okay, uh, now is the famous I see you. Now that's see not in a physical but in a spiritual sense. I see into you, I understand you, I connect with you. In Navi that's well ngati kameye, well ngati kameye. Try well ngati kameye. Well, yeah, well ngati, okay. So well is a form of the word I. Ngati is a form of the word you. By the way, that NG is, is tricky. It's a familiar sound we have in words like sing, bring, but here it's in an unfamiliar place, which is namely at the beginning of a word. Okay, so English doesn't do that. However, if you speak languages like Thai, Indonesian, Vietnamese, it's perfectly normal. This, in fact, was the biggest challenge for the actors. I thought it'd be the ejectors, but they nailed that completely. But the really hard thing was to take a familiar sound and put it in an unfamiliar place. So it's ngati, ngati. Now, the word C is kameye. So let's take a closer look at that. The root is kame, kame, which means C. But here's a part that's interesting. Here's the infix. And notice that the infix goes right before the final vowel. And this is a part that means I feel good about it. So kameye means I see you and I feel good about it. Okay, so the next thing to learn how to say is how are you, which is ngarulufomsrak. 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 Okay, you have a funny consonant cluster there, fom, but you can do it. Ngaru means, uh, literally by the way, means to you is well-being question. And the srak at the end, is simply a question word, it's a way to ask a yes-no question. Okay, now, uh, at this point, for icebreakers, you can try to say the same clever things on Pandora that you would on Earth. For example, do you come here often? <laughs> okay, and in Navi, that's ngazau fitsing im sarat. So, uh, try that. Ngazau fitsing im srak. Ngazau fitsing im srak. Yeah. Uh, nga is you. Zau with that glottal stop. Zau is come. Fitsing here. Im. Often. And srak. The way to ask the question again. Now, on the dating front, a well turned compliment can really move things along. So, here's, here's a frame which will allow you to praise various things about. Um, the person you're interested in. Ngea blank, lor lu Your whatever is very beautiful. Okay. Ngea uh, is your. Uh, Lord is beautiful. Lu is is or are. And nitan is very. So literally it means your blank, beautiful is very. And that's the way you say it. In Navi. What can go in the blank? Well, menari, eyes. Mesaidi lips, gay face, it's a tail, a real tail. Lurto, uh, smile. So to say your smile is very beautiful. Lurto, lor lunitan. Okay. Um, once you become a little bit more advanced, you can say things like, be my ikra and let's ride together. Okay. 
Now, uh, we'll get to ikran in a moment, but let's take a look at the word ride, which is makto. Makto is a root for ride. In this case, the idfix is iv, eve, and look where it goes this time. It goes there, and that's the way you say let's ride, nivakto. Uh, as for the ikran, that's the fierce looking flying beast, in English called the banshee, that will take you soaring through the skies of Pandora. Uh, here is Neytiri and her ikran seze. There's a strong bond between ikran and rider, and hopefully between you and your new friend as well. Now, if things, if things go really well, what if your heart leads you to say, I love you? By the way, that is one of the most frequently asked things that I got, he said, I love you. Okay. Well, I love you in, not the is, Nayaune luer. Nayaune luer. Try it. Nayaune luer. Na is you. Yaune is beloved. Lu are where to me. You, beloved, are to me. Nayaune luer. Now, of course, things don't often go that smoothly. I should say, don't always go that smoothly. I hope you won't have occasion to hear. Ftoi maskaun. Okay. By the way, this last word here, skaung, which means moron, and does appear in the film, I was, a, I was asked to come up with a word for that, um, was the word that probably took off more than any other on the set. The, the, the crew, the camera people, really liked that word, and they would turn to each other when something didn't go right, you know, skaung, <laughs> which, 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 which I thought was kind of cute. Well, there's a much nicer way to say goodbye, which I will say at the end of, of the little talk. So what happened to Navi after Avatar? In many respects, this to me is the most extraordinary thing of all. Soon after the movie came out, I began to see things like this. <laughs> this appeared on a website. Okay, it's all in Navi and it's very good Navi. And I'm saying to myself, where in the world did this come from and how are people learning? Because I had not put out any learning materials at all. Well, in a nutshell, a community developed online that took off and it, it, it just grew to what I think is quite incredible proportions. Uh, totally in, independent of me, the fans started a website called learnavi.org, which still very much exists. Last time I checked, which was a few months ago, um, the forums had a total of something like 400,000 posts. Okay, in 19 languages, including Klingon. <laughs> so there are, there are people who are talking about Navi in Klingon. I mean, who would have thought? Uh, how did they discover this stuff? Well, it was an amazing example of linguistic detective work. I had put out a few things. I was kind of reluctant to talk too much about it because I don't own the language. The language is owned by Fox Studios. And so the, the whole question is, how much am I allowed to say and not violate the terms of my contract? Uh, so I had said a few things. I had given some example sentences. Independent of me and unbeknownst to me, Fox Studios had published a book which gave a list of Navi words. Anyway, people essentially got together and deconstructed a lot of the language. And when I saw that, I began to get involved myself. And I began to become less reluctant to actually talk about it. Well, Long story short is that there is now a thriving Navi community of people who are using the language on a, literally a daily basis. I regularly get long emails written to me entirely in Navi, and it's very good Navi. Um, one of the best experiences of last year was in October, where I'm, my partner John and I drove from Los Angeles to uh, Sonoma County, California. It's about an eight-hour drive. Uh, to attend the first International Invitational Navi Conference and Workshop, organized by one of the major, major enthusiasts of the language, held at his home in a real forest. I mean, it, it couldn't have been better. There, it, it wasn't a huge group because they couldn't accommodate that many in a private home. There were maybe 16 people, including four who flew in from Europe. England, France, Switzerland, and Sweden just to be there. We spent an incredible weekend. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back. This, um, 
these are some of the people uh, involved. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We tried to speak Navi as much as possible. There was a morning session. I mean, it, it was organized along military lines. You know, at 10 o'clock we do this, at 12 o'clock we do this, and so on. Uh, there was a session in the morning where we could only speak Navi. It was, it was a challenge. I, what I discovered, and um, this is not false modesty, I discovered that there are people who speak and write the language much better than I do. And that actually was, 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 was a source of pride for me, the fact that people have gotten into it to, to that extent. I mean, I had something I had to turn to people to say, how do you say this? They say, That's the way. Because they had memorized the vocabulary, and I still had to look it up, what I had come up with. Uh, here's, uh, there were some hijinks, as you ma imagine here. Uh, here are two guys who are reenacting a, 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 a scene from, from Avatar. Uh, <laughs> But there was, there was some serious stuff, too. And some of the workshops were on a remarkably high linguistic level. Uh, let me go back a couple of slides. This is some of the stuff that has come out of the community. Um, this is our answer to Hello Kitty, <laughs> which is, which is called it, follow look on Hello Thanator. Okay. Uh, there are amazingly creative people who have put together little stories to help people learn the language, illustrated. Uh, there's a review of the movie Inception written entirely in Navi. <laughs> there is my blog, which I started um, oh, about uh, half a year ago. It's really, it's really quite an extraordinary development. And it's an ongoing thing. We're trying to expand the vocabulary. Uh, that's probably the main task right now. We, have, we only have about 1,400 words, which is not very much at all. And so there's, there's an ongoing effort. I'm taking part in it. People are sending in suggestions. I'm still the gatekeeper. I decide what's in and what's out. But I'm getting very good suggestions from people. Why? Why in the world <laughs> is this going on? I, 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 I can't tell you that I really have the answer completely. Part of it, I think, is, is the exhilaration of getting involved in something intellectual and something fun and something that can be used for real communication. I think there's something else, though. Uh, I don't kid myself into thinking that anything like this would have happened if this language had not been connected with one of the most extraordinary films, I think, <clears throat> that's ever, ever been shown. Uh, Avatar has had a tremendous effect on people, which, which I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, people, people really relate to the philosophy of the movie. They relate to the planet. They want to live there. They want to experience this dangerous, exotic, exhilarating world. Well, we can't go to Pandora, but one thing we can do is speak the language of Pandora. And I think that's a, a large part of the appeal of the language. So with that, I will leave you with one of our parting uh, greetings, which is Ewa Nahu, Ewa be with you. Ewa being the, the, the goddess, the, the, the female divinity that protects the balance of life. And I thank you all very much for uh, learning about Navi. Thank you. Do, 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 do you want to do anything? Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll take one or two questions right now. <laughs> oh, where are you? <laughs> Someone here had a question. So I recognize the phenomenon that some words have interrupted components, such as a word with additional letters interrupted. That's another kind of expression, right? I'm sorry, I, d I didn't quite get that. Could you, could you repeat it? Uh, so sorry. Um, some uh, simple words can be uh, add some additional components. Usually in English, it is in the front or the back. Yes. But in some, it is interrupted in the middle. In the middle, yes. It's, so it's the word is interrupted, uh, yes. Uh -huh. So is it uh, exist in uh, African or other uh, places? Yeah, uh, th these infixes exist. Um, in, for example, certain Philippine languages, like Tagalog, or, or, or also known as, as 
Filipino has, has, has those infixes. Also, um, people have looked at languages like Hebrew and Arabic and analyzed those verb forms as having infixes as well. So yeah, those are possible in Earth languages, but not all that common. Hi, I had a question. Um, sure. Did you work with the actors at all? That the native, the actors that were portraying native Navi people. Did you work with them with their English accents? Like, is there uh, such a thing as a Navi accent for someone who's native Navi and has learned English? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's something that 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 we uh, we talked about. And um, fortunately, that wasn't my domain. I, I had enough to worry about. But the one who did worry about that was the wonderful dialect coach we had, whose name was Carla Meyer, and. She worked on developing a Navi accent in English, and it's a really interesting question because you know if if you speak one language, that language will influence the way you speak another language, usually. And so the question is, how does the Navi sound system, or perhaps even the grammar, influence the way someone would would speak English? So yeah, we did we did discuss that. Um, we kind of pulled back a little bit. We didn't want the Navi accent in English to sound too strange. Because if it did, that would, and James Cameron felt very strongly about this, that would create too much of a distance between the audience and the character. So Nathiti speaks really good English, <laughs> as, as you notice. She makes, she makes a few little weird things and mistakes in the beginning. But basically, she speaks very good, she has very good grammar, and her accent, although I think unique and individual, is very easy to understand. This will be our final okay. question of the night. Um, there will be a reception to follow during which you can ask further questions. Sure. Um, how would you say um, numbers higher than 16? Because you said that eight is the like number count. So uh -huh. 16 would be the highest that you could count, wouldn't no. it be? No. Or how would you say 17 well, or Well, okay. Higher? So um, one, to eight, uh, one to eight, you have the words. And then nine is eight and one. Then eight, eight and two, eight and three, and four. Okay, when you get to eight and seven, the next number is two eights. And then above that is two eights and one, two eights and two, two eights and three. And so th that's th th okay. Then, of course, the question is what happens when you get to 64? Okay, th and then you need a new word, <laughs> which we have. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you.